I'm very excited about our first uh, speaker here, uh, who is a writer, uh, a former journalist, maybe still a journalist, he'll tell you all about it, but is, is a best-selling uh, author. Uh, has anybody here read the book Disrupted? Woo! Yes. Uh, just a hilarious book. Uh, Dan uh, has been around uh, our communities for a long, long time. Uh, he was a writer at Forbes, he at Newsweek, he uh, also uh, became known as Fake Steve Jobs for a while. Uh, many of you know him. He's got a great sense of humor. He's been a screenwriter for the television show Silicon Valley. In addition to this wonderful book he's written, uh, please welcome Dan Lyons. Welcome. Thank you very Thanks much. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, so my son and I are here together, and, and we're skiers, so we're actually very excited about all the snow. Um, <clears throat> although, I don't know if we'll, we're supposed to leave tomorrow. Um, I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to, to Jim and to, to all of you for, for inviting me to, to come here. Um, uh, my son is with me. He's sitting right there in the front, and that's him meeting Linus yesterday. My son is 11. His name is Paul, and he's an aspiring techie hacker. He's wearing his Born to Hack t-shirt today. Uh, so if anybody has a job opening or an internship <laughs> or an 11-year-old, he's a very hard worker. Um, no, and, and um, I, I think it's great that you make this family friendly and that, uh, that he got a chance to come to this talk. He's never come with me to a conference before, but this one I thought would be great. And, the highlight so far is that he got to meet Linus yesterday after Linus's talk and to hear that great talk that Linus gave. And um, that last bit that, that Linus said about uh, work being 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, I, I kind of thought, like, I'm getting a little heat for taking him out of school this week, you know? And, um, and he has a twin sister who is at school and part of the heat. Anyway, but. Uh, uh, but I, I really feel like, like hearing that talk yesterday from Linus was worth more than a week's uh, missed school. Well, it was only four days. But, but that was such a, an inspiring talk for a young person to hear that that's what life is about, that it's about working hard and just doing the work. You know? So I, I, I was very, very grateful that he could be here for that. Um, I'm also grateful because I really think this is a very special community. Um, the open source community. I didn't realize until I heard Linus talk yesterday that it's 25 years old. Like it, just, it seems to have gone by so quickly to me as things happen when you become elderly. You know? but, but, uh, but, but it really is something special. And the first time it, that ever clicked with me was about 10 years ago, Canonical, the guys who make Ubuntu, uh, invited me to come talk at their, they had a conference every other year for all of their employees. And this one year it was in, outside Barcelona. And I got to go and give a talk and, and just hang out with them for two or three days. And I, at the time, I was a reporter either at Forbes or Newsweek. I, I, I think I was at Newsweek then. Anyway, um, I was overwhelmed by the affection that these people had for each other, the, the genuine sense of community they had with each other. They were people who worked uh, all over the world and often only knew each other by email. But once every two years, they would all meet and finally get to see each other in person. And so I had meals with them and hung out with them. And I, I came back home kind of overwhelmed by the experience of what a, a, a fantastic culture this was at this company. Um, and I think this community feels the same way to me, that it's people working together on things with, with, on shared goals um, and who aren't driven by uh, this idea of, of, of getting rich quick uh, or maybe getting rich ever, you know. Um, but um, um, so last night, here in the lobby just hanging around. We ran into Jim, we ran into Sam Ramji, from, who's now at Google, uh, and other people, and they were all so nice and so engaging. And Paul and I were having dinner at one of the receptions, and, and Linus and his wife sat down, and we sort of sat there talking about school and skiing and kids, and it was just, uh, just really, really the nicest people I've ever met. And I think one of the great things about being a tech journalist for so long and, and uh, working in and around the industry in various ways has been the people I've met. More than anything else, it's just, I've met so many fantastic people and I'm sure you feel the same way. Like, you make these lifelong friends. Um, uh, so that's my way of, of saying so The next thing is I, I need to start also with an apology. I've been told that this is me as a, uh, my first communion. Um, and the real, the real story, I grew up Catholic and so I'm really good at, at confessing and apologizing and seeking forgiveness. Um, for a long time, I was a pariah of the industry. Um, 
and I think in, in some places I still am. Um, and these are all fake uh, addresses. You can't really reach me in any of those. So uh, I put them up there to look, look legit, but I'm not. No, if you want to send me hate mail, you can. Um, um, it's because in 2003, I was at Forbes, and I covered this lawsuit. I was covering IBM, and this little company called SCO sued IBM. Uh, they had bought the rights to an old version of Unix, and then they were going to try to leverage that and, and shake down IBM for some money. And I wrote a very in-depth article looking at all the sort of cross-dealing that SCO was and how they had done the same uh, playbook on Microsoft. There was just one bad thing that put me on the wrong foot with the open source community, which is the headline of the story said, what SCO wants, SCO gets. And people took that to mean that I, I was rooting for SCO and, and I thought they would win. I actually did think they might win because <clears throat> they, had, they had done this to Microsoft, but it um, wasn't quite the same as being on their side. But um, I'm here to apologize even now for this 14-year-old headline that I didn't write. Someone else put, the, some, some, some editor in New York put this headline on, but anyway. Um, over the years, my headlines about SCO got more and more negative, like bumbling bully, the gang that couldn't sue straight, dumb and dumber, SCO gets TKO'd and then snowed by SCO, but it didn't matter. And this is 2007. At this point, I was already a pariah. So um, I am here again, as I say, to apologize. Compounding that problem was that then when I did Fake Steve, I had to ask myself, what would Fake Steve, what would Steve Jobs think about open source? And my feeling is that Steve Jobs would think, it's great, you want to give me free stuff? Thanks, assholes, I'll take it. And, uh, you know, and then I'll charge you for it, right? Like that was, that was basically how I thought Steve probably thought of open source. I mean, uh, his operating system is based on BSD, I think, right? And, and so he started with open source code. But, um, and then the Free Software Foundation decided to pick a fight with Apple, and I, I, I thought, like, this is a gift from the gods because, like, I thought, okay, the Linux crazies are pretty crazy, but the Apple crazies are even crazier. And I'm writing fake Steve thinking, okay, you Linux guys want to have a fight? Okay, wait till I unleash the Apple hordes on you, right? So we did this. Oh, then Richard Stallman, I discovered Richard Stallman, who was an endless trough, a well of, of, uh, of comedy, right? He, Welcome to freedom, your rule book is in the mail. Um, this is him killing a shark that had violated the GPL. So, um, uh, so yeah. I'll tell you a true story, because I live in Boston, I'm sorry. Uh, I, there were a lot more of those, but I picked this as one. Uh, I live in Boston, and a couple years ago, I went to this thing with my wife. It was Bulgarian folk singing, right? Because my wife is into this stuff. And, uh, <laughs> My wife was one of them in college. And then so afterwards, there was like a little after party and people were dancing and doing the weird Bulgarian folk dancing. And there is Richard Stallman. And he's dancing around with, like, with flowers on. And he sees me across the room and our eyes meet. And I thought, oh my God, he knows who I am, right? And I said to my wife, we've got to get out of here like now. Like we, and we did. We took off. I was like, I'm not going to have this guy come over and attack me, right? Um, I even once made fun of Linus, more than once, but a couple times I did make fun of Linus, even though I have and always have had a kind of man crush on Linus, and I never got to meet him as a reporter. He's very elusive. He won't even like, talk to you on email. It's hard to even get an email from Linus. This is, by the way, during his People magazine, Sexiest Man Alive phase, which I love. When, when the fame got to his head, he got a little crazy. Um, so, but I don't want to leave it up there for too long because, you know, uh, bleach in the eyes. But, uh, uh, so, uh, but he... Um, I've always admired him, but I could never meet him. So finally here, I finally got to meet this guy who's been like a hero of mine for 20 years. Um, in real life, during my day job, I actually have been a sort of big open source fan. So I, I switched to Android very early when I was at Newsweek um, and then did a, a really big cover on on uh, Android, and I realized at the time, for every, you know, for year after year after year, we would get these stories where people would say, this is the year of Linux on the desktop. This is gonna be the year of desktop Linux. It's gonna happen, right? And then it would never happen, right? And then <clears throat> when I saw Android, I thought, this is it. This is Linux on the desktop. This is gonna be it. This is the thing, right? Uh, it, it, that Andy Rubin had done what Steve Jobs had done in a way, which is say, okay, forget the desktop. Let's look to the next generation ahead. Let's look to mobile devices, and let's focus there. Um, this story, by the way, is worth looking up. There were some really, now in retrospect, really funny predictions. Like by 2014, Android, some say, could have 25% market share. Of course, it was 80%, right? So um, Android turned out to be bigger even than, than we, I guess, thought it was going to be back in 2010. And it's also amazing to me just that in seven years that how much that world has changed and how open source has become just basically the platform of everything now. Um, okay. I want to talk to you quickly about my, this book and this adventure I went on and some things that I think have gone wrong in tech that are sort of, in a way, the opposite of the open source community. Um, and this book came out last year. Uh, it's coming out in paperback 
uh, in a couple months, I left cards outside on that little table under a mirror if anybody wants to pick up a card and, and get in touch with me afterwards, uh, just grab a card and there's my contact info on it. Um, so in short, the story is that I was a tech reporter and I was at Newsweek when basically it went under. <clears throat> and, um, in 2012, and I got laid off, and I was 52 years old. And I looked around, and it wasn't just that my company was going out of business, my business was going out of business. And I always wanted to work at a, a tech company. I always had this idea of working at a startup. They always seemed to be having so much more fun than we were, you know, the journalists. You know, you'd go visit these guys, and it looked like they're having a blast, right? Because they're all growing, the companies are making money, they're, they're, they're hiring rather than laying off. I had spent the last 10, 20 years in companies where you're always waiting for the next layoff. So I went to work at a place called HubSpot, which makes marketing software. Um, and it was like, had every startup cliche. They're in Boston, so I didn't have to move. They had every startup cliche you can imagine. So we had the dogs in the office. We had nap rooms. We had beanbag chairs, which at age 52, you should not have conference rooms with beanbag chairs, because you can get into the beanbag chair, but you can't get back out. Like, there's no graceful way to get out of a beanbag chair, you know? So you'd see all these people kind of crawling around on all fours after a meeting, which I thought was very undignified. Um, they had. The average age was 26, literally half my age, right? And almost everybody was right out of college. They had these like bros who would like, they had a push-up club in the lobby at lunchtime, like doing their, their bro thing, like do you even lift? And, um, <clears throat> and I have to say, I very quickly realized it was like a blend, it was like a mix of a frat house, a Montessori kindergarten, and a Scientology compound, right? It was like, <laughs> like all three things in once, right? And <laughs> thank you. So. Um, equal parts of each. They had a culture code, they, they loved culture, they wanted to talk about culture, we're gonna make culture overt and explicit, and we're gonna create a company that we love, right? Um, and the culture code basically just defined how, what does it mean to be HubSpotty? How do you belong to the cult, right? Like how do you fit in? And they had a, a couple acronyms, HART and VORP. VORP was value over replacement player, which is like, comes from baseball, pro baseball, like why are we paying you more than what we could pay the average person to do your job? which is a, a cruel metric. And the other one, in my case, I thought they should have a negative VORP because they were paying me a pretty good salary and I did almost nothing, right? So, um, and heart was, you had to be humble, effective, adaptable, remarkable, and transparent, right? And at, the, at, the, at one point I had to have a, a review with my boss, who was a guy not my, in, in, my for, in the 40s, say, but two grown men and we had to sit in this little tiny room and he had to give me a heart score and I got a two. And I kind of thought like, how has it happened that two grown men are sitting in a room having a discussion about such obvious risible bullshit, right? Like, like to say, you know, like heart, what's your heart score? Like, and how, and, but it sounded all scientific. Here's your number, we can, we're a data-driven organization. Your heart is a two. I'm like, why, it should be a zero, right? I, mean, I have no heart, right? Um, they had training when you joined and they would talk about your superpower, like what's your superpower? And they would talk about this literally and I would burst out laughing. I was a journalist, right? Like, I mean, you know, journalists really don't like this stuff. So what's your superpower? What is your superpower? And we went around, they had two weeks of training, we had to learn how to use the product, but it was really indoctrination, right? And they would tell these kids, do you know how lucky you are to be here? Thousands of people wanted the job that you got, but it's harder to get a job here than to get into Harvard, right? Which is totally not true, but anyway. but. Um, uh, and so they would feed them all this stuff, and then they would be like, okay, what's your superpower? And then we had to go around and tell something about ourselves that no one knew that made us special and made us a snowflake, you know? And um, I'm like, I don't really, you know, have anything, you know? And like one guy was, I play in a heavy metal band on weekends. Like, oh, cool, you know? I was like, well, I don't, I'm the only one in this room who's had a colonoscopy, right? And, they, and they're like, they, they take a hose. You kids, you won't believe this, but trust me, this is coming for you, right? They take a hose, but they do give you, they give you pills. You don't remember it, you know, but you know they did it, right? You know? Um, and they're just looking at me like, dude, what is wrong with you? Like, no, like nobody laughs, right? Like, nobody, you know, nobody laughs, right? That was my superpower. I endured the colonoscopy, right? I'm the only one here who takes Lipitor. I have high cholesterol, so, you know. Um, so, um, and then the main way to succeed was just to be enthusiastic. You didn't have to do anything. You just had to be a team player, like a total team player. You had to be GSD, get shit done. And this is a real chalkboard, HubSpot equals cool. Like somebody at work just stopped on their way to get coffee and just wrote HubSpot equals cool on a chalkboard. Like I don't know why, right? Um, they had a slogan, one plus one equals three, right? Which you guys all did math. You know that's not true, right? But I mean, so one plus one equals three. And then they would say things like, I like that idea, but I don't think it's one plus one equals three enough. You know, we're HubSpot. We have to do something a little better. I'm like, I, what? So. Uh, <laughs> And they had cheers for peers. So constantly people would be cheering for each other because the way to get attention or to get, 
to move up in the organization was to show that you gave praise to other people. It took me a long time to figure this out. So we would get these praisegasms, I call them. They were like emails with, um, someone would say like, oh my God, I just want to say that Ashley last week totally crushed it when she was running the blog all by herself, right? <laughs> but it would be to everyone, right? Everyone in the whole department would get this email. And then the protocol was to reply to all. You had to reply to all saying, oh, God, girl, you go. You know, like, woohoo, ask me for president. And, like, and if you didn't reply to all, like, you looked like a curmudgeon, right? And then you, so your email would fill up with, like, 100 emails from people all saying the same shit to each other, right? And for a while, I would ignore it. Then I thought, like, I'm looking like a grumpy old guy. So I joined in and would be like, woohoo, and I'd put, like, 800 exclamation points, you know? And then someone figured out, like, dude, you're being a dick. Stop that, right? So, like, uh, so I'm thinking, like, this place is nuts, right? This place is really crazy. And then one day, the founder there published an article on LinkedIn. He had a new management breakthrough, which is that he really wants to always be solving for the customer. And so he would bring a teddy bear to all of his management meetings, and they would have to talk to the teddy bear as if it were a customer. That was a way to remind you to always solve for the customer, right? So I'm like, okay, this is officially nuts, right? Like, I spent, I spent all these years writing about Apple from the outside, envisioning it as this cult compound, and now I'm living in a real cult compound, right? This is even crazier than I ever imagined Apple, even as a fiction writer, right? So I, I sat desk to desk with this guy who was like my boss, who was like 12, and I was like, and I was like Dude, hey, dude, that thing with the teddy bear, that's crazy, right? And he's like, well, no. And I'm like, look, I was like, look, no one else is around. You can tell me. Like, we know. It's nuts, right? And he's like, no, I think it's, you know, it's kind of eccentric, but it's cool. I was like, oh, my God, right? So, I, I, like, no one will laugh at the teddy bear. That was even worse to me than the teddy bear was the fact that no one would laugh at it, right? So I called, I called a friend of mine who had left journalism and become a marketing guy but had done it successfully, unlike me. And... Uh, and I said to him, I told him about the teddy bear, I showed him the article, I was like, is this normal? Like, man, is this what it's like in the corporate world? I didn't know, you know? And he's like, no, dude, this is Jonestown. Like, get out now. <laughs> like, run now. Like, you're, you're sort of one step from having to be, drink Kool-Aid. Like, literally, they're going to go around, you're going to do the mass suicide, the white robes, the whole thing, right? So, um, and this is what, meanwhile, everybody else looked at, this is a real picture. And this is how they were every day. It was like, it was like being in La La Land. It was like, people, like living in a musical. Uh, this, everybody was really, really happy, right? And I was not, and I, which makes you miserable. It makes, it's crazy making, because you're like, maybe something's wrong with me. Because they are all really, really happy. And maybe the world has changed, and now people bring teddy bears to work, and that's cool, and that's normal, right? Um, but as time went on, I realized, that, oh, I went going the wrong way. Um, in fact, it wasn't, people weren't happy. When they did studies and they did surveys, they, they did relentless happiness surveys. They had very high turnover and very low morale. And that puzzled me too, but then I realized there were two cultures. There was a surface culture, which is all that crap. Then there was a real culture, right? And the real culture was that they had this huge sales boiler room, this telemarketing boiler room, where they put me in for a while to punish me for asking for a new job. And it was like really, really loud. And I had to listen to this guy named Noisy Pete all day long, get on the phone and say the same script over and over. Hey, Bob, how's it going down in Orlando? How's the weather down there? Yeah, great. Hey, what's your marketing plan for this year? And they click, hang up, start again, right? Smile and dial all day. So these kids would get paid very little money, stuck in a room, given a really hard number to hit that they couldn't hit, they would get burned out, and then they'd get churned out. And in the rest of the company, it was the same way, only it was even less rational, because you could get fired for no reason at all. And this, they'd have a little group of people, and one would be made the boss, and she would just fire all the people she didn't like, right? Because they had these untrained managers, these undertrained managers. Nobody got any training at all. So it was just like Lord of the Flies, right? You just take a bunch of kids and put them in a room and let them be crazy with each other, right? Um, one of my favorite stories was, oh, when, and when they fired you, they called it graduation. This is great. This is a great thing. And we get these cheery emails saying, hey, everybody, just want you to know that Derek has graduated. We can't wait to see where he's going with his next big superpower rock star adventure. It's like, dude, you fired that guy, right? And you'd look over and be like, wait a minute, Derek's gone? Like, and then you'd look and his desk is empty. Everything's, it was like spinal tap drummers. Just poof, they go up in a pile of stuff, right? Like people, and it would happen all the time. People would get fired all the time. It was like living in Argentina in the 1970s. Just boom, they just disappear, right? So... Um, and then I realized they don't even think this is a problem. They think this is great. The high turnover thing was actually like they would say, you know, they would explain it by saying, well, you know, we're, we're, we're rock stars and we can only play with other rock stars. So, you know, if you weren't a rock star, you got graduated, right? And this wasn't even unique to them. It came from Netflix. This is from the culture code, but this came from Netflix. We're a team, not a family, right? This idea that, you know, we, uh, we need to have 
A players in every position, but it's telemarketing, right? It's customer support. It's not, you know, anyway, it's more like, it's just a way to use a vendetta on people, right? The other thing I started looking around and realizing is they had this huge emphasis on culture fit, which I think has become this terrible euphemism, this really bad euphemism, which really means racism and, and lack of diversity. And it's a way of sort of turning a negative into a positive. So I look around, there's no one over 30, like hardly, except for me, and one other guy who wanted to become my friend, and we used to go for lunch together, and they had to break up because people would see us paired up, like the two old guys, right? <laughs> we had to have a man break up. So, um, but, there were, and there were no people of color, like no black people. We went, the first time we had a whole company meeting, I looked, it was 700 people in a room, and it's like all just white kids in their 20s, and like not even a very diverse group of white people. Like Klan rallies have a wider swath of the <laughs> Caucasian population than we had. We had like one kind of white person. It looked like the kids you see on Cape Cod in the summer. Like Cape Cod just barked up the whole population, <laughs> launched them into Cambridge, and they all landed in one building, right? Um, so, I started realizing there were really serious problems about this. Like the, the, the industry in a way had gone wrong in ways I, wasn't, I, I didn't understand. Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn actually brags about this. So don't think of your job as a career. You're not coming here to work for a long time. You're not gonna do what Linus Torvalds does and write an OS for 25 years. No, you're gonna, you're gonna work here for a year and a half and then we're gonna graduate you and you're gonna go do something else, right? Um, at Amazon, this, so I left to write this book, and they hacked my computers and tried to find out what I was writing, and then the FBI got involved. There's a great, great other story that's in the end of the book. But uh, Amazon, you know, you walk out of a conference room, grown people are sitting there crying at their desks, right? And I start thinking, like, I've stumbled into a much bigger story than I realized. And people start writing me. People read my book and start writing me, telling me these horror stories of things like what I experienced at HubSpot wasn't really all that unusual. In fact, it's becoming the norm, right? Um, Jeffrey Pfeffer, who's a, a professor at Stanford, wrote an essay when my book came out, Why Modern Work Culture Makes People So Miserable, right? Um, Say it's, it's a return to the a work arrangements of 140 years ago, not some a new managerial innovation. It's worth, if you're in the gig economy, God forbid you lose your job and now you have to become an Uber driver because they won't even pay you as an employee, right? They may force you to be a contractor. And VCs won't invest in your company if it's a gig economy company if you want to make your employees actual employees, right? Which kind of kills me because Uber has apparently $10 billion in cash sitting in the bank that VCs have given it, but they won't pay their, their drivers as employees. They won't give them benefits, right? Um, when, the, when the drivers sued, Uber spent $100 million to settle the suit to make it go away, which tells you how badly they don't want to make people employees, right? Amazon has people living in tents in Scotland because they can't afford to live near where they work, and Jeff Bezos charges them 10 bucks a day, 10 pounds a day to ride a bus. Jeff Bezos is worth $70 billion, but he makes his employees pay 10 pounds a day to ride a bus to work, so instead they sleep in tents, right? So what's happened is we've created this class of people called the precariat, right, who either get in a job but then bounce every 18 months or are never, can't get a job at all, right? Are, and uh, antidepressant usage is up 400%, suicide rates highest in 30 years, right? So we're making work fun, like on the surface. It helps, it was fun, right? We're giving, giving people this, right? Um, but it's making people miserable, right? Which is this weird uh, kind of conundrum, right? Uh, or, and I think the reason is we're taking away all these basic things, save for retirement, work-life balance, a fair share of the equity. When HubSpot went public, they had a big party. A handful of people made hundreds of millions of dollars, and we all went to a party, and they gave each of us a little bottle of that fresh net sparkling wine, you know, the fake champagne. And then they had a girl checking off a checklist so that you didn't take two. Like, you couldn't sneak back in and get your second bottle of, of fake champagne. Anyway, uh, so then I asked myself, why is Silicon Valley changed? And I'm going to try to get through this quickly because I know I'm running out of time. BC, I think, uh, is the problem, right? From 1995 to 2015, the venture capital industry twice the number of funds, twice the number of firms, four times the number of active investors, and four times as much capital under management. If you go back prior to 95, I haven't been able to do this analysis yet, I think it's way, way more dramatic, right? But this is basically the beginning of the dot-com explosion, right? Netscape's IPO. Um, BC, cumulative capital, 66 billion to 627 billion in 2015. Total VC investments, 8 billion to 60 billion. So you just have a huge amount of money rushing into this space, right, um, in, 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 in search of a return. Um, and the motto of this new economy is grow fast, lose money, go public, cash out, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, all the focus is on customer acquisition, revenue acquisition, buying top line growth, lose as much money as you want, right? I did an analysis recently from my fortune column. 60 tech IPOs since 2011 that are still independent. A lot of them have been gone public and got taken out or acquired, right? Only 10 have ever made a profit, 
right? If you look at how much money Twitter alone has lost, it's like two and a half billion dollars since it went public, right? Crazy. But meanwhile, every one of these has create, created, you know, centimillionaires and billionaires. So these people are, are foisting these really risky, money-losing companies into the public markets, skating away with their money, and then leaving for it, leaving, you know, the, the day of reckoning will come, right? I think there's also something else is happening. In the, in the old days, if you look back at the early days of HP, when H and P were running HP, they saw themselves as having four constituencies, customers, community, employees, and investors. And, in, and investors came last, right? They wanted to have happy customers. They wanted to pay their taxes and be part of the community. They wanted to take care of their employees and make sure their employees had a good life and could feed their kids and, and you know, put their kids through school and save for retirement. That's all gone away, and now there's only one constituency that matters, and that's investors. And we've somehow taken it for granted in the last 20 years that this is the new normal, that the people who matter most are the investors. When really all the investors are doing, the VCs, I spoke at a VC conference recently, this joke did not go over well. I said, you guys have the best job in the world. You take money from one group of people. You don't take your money. You take their money. Then you give it to these guys. You work them like dogs. By the time they succeed, you own all of their company, and you make all the money. Like, that sounds like a great racket. But that has become the racket, right? Um, the other side effects of this are bro culture, income inequality, and worse, right? So bro culture, this was not HubSpot, but it looked like HubSpot. The, the, the CEO of HubSpot was like the world's oldest teenager. He was 47 years old, still loved to hang out with the kids and wear his like big funny hat on the Cinco de Mayo party. But they, you have bros who invest in bros who hire other bros, and they call it culture fit, right? They have this frat house culture. They have go for a beer as a basis of hiring. Like, I like to hire someone that I want to have a beer with after work, which is the stupidest reason to hire anyone ever, right? Like, like, <coughs> thank you. And, but they will actually say this. At HubSpot, when I got hired, they said, that I like to hire a guy I want to go. It's like, I don't drink, and I'm never going for a beer with you because you're an asshole, but, but I still want to work here, right? But um, no, but they, they, that is like the reason they give to hire people, right? Um, and you have CEOs who have no experience, and they have no adult supervision. In the old days, it, in the old days, meaning like Google, even Google had to hire Eric Schmidt, or the VCs wouldn't put the money in, right? Now the idea is no, just let Evan Spiegel go at it with Snap, right? Um, so you have this, that, and then you have bias along on every vector: age, race, gender, right? HubSpot had, like I said, nobody my age no one of color, and then there were a lot of women, but they only got this high, no women in any power. You look at the management page, I have a couple of funny slides that I didn't put in here. If you look at, go through a list of every management team in tech, white guys, white guys, white guys, and it looks like they were all made in the same white guy lab, like they were all hatched from the same kind of egg. They don't even look like different kinds of white guys, right? Um, income inequality, this is, I think, another factor of skewing all the return to those investors and letting them skate away and not dispersing the money out throughout all the employees. For example, Uber, the taxi market is, say, let's say it's a $100 billion market globally. It's $100 billion, but it's spread among thousands and thousands or millions of, of little customer companies, right, and individuals. Uber replaces that, has a $60 billion market cap, and that $60 billion will be in the hands of maybe 100 people, right, when they finally go public. Um, Eight men control as much wealth as half of the world. This number came out recently. A few years ago, it was a few hundred, which was already pretty appalling, right? But now it's down to eight. The other thing to notice, I think, since we're at an open source conference, is that two of these guys are, are made their money in the old world of closed source software, which was probably the greatest racket ever invented on, on planet Earth, right? But most of them are techies, even Bloomberg, if you count him, right? Um, CEO to worker compensation ratio. This is a really interesting chart, because you see it go, back in 65, it was 20x. And it crept up, crept up through the 70s, through the 80s. And then look where it peaks, 2000, the height of the dot-com mania. Boom, look who's making all the money, the CEOs, 376. And then you think, OK, the crash comes, everything will settle back down. But it doesn't. It comes back down to 300 now. So it's basically, it went way off the rails and then stayed there. Um, and then worse, right? To recap, I think the fin financialization of the economy, where, where the finance industry now is 20% of GDP, leads to only investors matter, leads to eight men control half as much money as half the world, I mean control as much money as half the world, leads to the precariat, this angry mob of people who have nothing, right? Which leads to this, Brexit and, you know, he, he who shall not be named, right? Um, but the precariat, I think, lashed out. People lashed out. People realized they're getting screwed, and they lashed out at the, at the ballot box. It was the last bit of power people have, is I may not have any money, I may not have a pension, I may not have health insurance, but I got one thing that even Larry Ellison has, is I have a vote. I have as much of a vote as Larry Ellison, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to screw you with it, right? So if we keep going in this direction, I think we end up here. 
This is a guy who made a lot of money on Amazon, one of the early investors, who two years ago said, the pitchforks are coming for us. This is a story from the New Yorker recently, Doomsday Prep for the Super Rich, which I highly recommend you read. Evan Osnos wrote this thing about how people like Peter Thiel are now bugging out for New Zealand and making bolt holes, right? Trying to escape from the mess they've created. Like instead of taking their billions of dollars and trying to fix the system we have by paying taxes, Apple has $264 billion in cash sitting outside the country and won't bring it back unless they get a special break. Why don't they want to pay taxes? And they complain, we don't have any STEM grads. We'll pay your fucking taxes, right? You know, so, um, you know, Fix your schools, right? So instead, they're going to bolt hole out, and they're going to live in New Zealand. They're going to live in bunkers, right? Seriously, they're going to live in bunkers with their billions of dollars, which to me is insane, right? Which is another way of saying, I came around to realize Richard Stallman was right, right? Like, after all those years, I made fun of Richard Stallman. I'm like, oh my god, I've turned into Stallman, right? I'm 56 years old now. I've become Richard Stallman. You're supposed to become more conservative as you get older. I've become a crazy Bernie Sanders liberal, right? But like... Um, but I think Stallman did see this. Stallman saw what happens with Microsoft. Where does that lead to? Yeah, Bill Gates becomes the richest guy on earth. And you, you have this income inequality, you have this disparity, and you have this huge mass of people who rise up and create problems for all of us, right? Um, we make this joke on Silicon Valley. I don't want to live in a world where someone else makes the world a better place better than we do. And we kind of make a joke about how techies all talk about making the world a better place. My one last message to you is I actually think techies can make the world a better place, but it's not by making Snapchat, right? I think it's by creating a company that hires 10 people, right, and pays them really, really well and so that they can have a good life and a good career and have a family and have kids and save for retirement. And if you make a company with 10 people and you make one with 10 people and I make one with three people because I won't do as well as you, but, you know, and then you have 100 and 10, you know, we can basically make this world a better. We can make the world we want to live in, right? We can build the world we want to live in. We can make the kind of companies we want to work for. That's what I saw at Canonical 10 years ago, and I still think it's true today. Um, I'm sorry for rushing so fast, but thank you. And again, I'm very, very sorry for all my old Richard Stallman jokes because it turns out he was right. Th uh, thank you very much. Thank you.